Hi, this is Alex from Asher Lectures. Today we'll be doing a close reading of Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, looking at Act 2, Scene 3 and Act 3, Scene 1. We'll be focusing on the moments in which both Benedict and Beatrice fall for the traps of deception laid out for them, that is, when they are convinced that each one is in love with the other. We'll be doing a comparative or syntopical reading of sorts here. Comparative viewpoints are useful to think about when looking at Much Ado About Nothing, because the play revolves around these oppositional pairs. We have two pairs of lovers, two brothers, and here, two deceptions. Of course, in your essays, when you're making these sort of comparisons, you'll want to be using language like similarly, or compared to, or contrasted with, or juxtaposed against. For example, we can start by looking at the way the men in Act 2, Scene 3, versus the women in Act 3, Scene 1, speak about the topics of love and romance. That is, look at the form of their language. So you note here that both Don Pedro and Benedict are speaking in prose, that is, your normal standard spoken language, compared to Hero and Beatrice over here, who is speaking in verse. So they're using iambic pentameter, which is 10 syllables per line of unstressed, stressed alternating syllables. Hero even has this nice rhyming couplet, haps, traps, whilst Beatrice almost uses a Shakespearean sonnet. So Shakespearean sonnets consist of 14 lines, where they have three quatrains and a finishing rhyming couplet. So it follows this rhyming structure of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and then G, G for the couplet at the end. Beatrice's bit over here consists of only 10 lines, however it's two quatrains and a couplet. So we have our two separate quatrains here, and then our couplet at the end. You'll note that the quatrains follow an internal rhyming structure, so we have true adjut, a a, much such, b b, c c, c c, hand and band, d d, and then i and reportingly, uh, maybe they made it work back in, Sha back in Shakespearean times. Okay, but it's not sufficient just to describe or just to recognize this point of difference. You need to be able to explain the significance behind it. You need to be able to explain why Shakespeare made this point of comparison. We can perhaps find our clue when Don Pedro says, the sport will be. Maybe that word sport is an indication of how the men view the affairs of love, romance, marriage, etc. as a game of sorts. They see this entire thing as a nice funny prank they could play on Benedict. Contrasted against the women's more elevated use of verse, which perhaps suggests, perhaps indicates, that they view these affairs as more serious, more important. It should be noted that Benedict, in fact, changes his tune after he falls into the trap, after he's convinced that Beatrice is in fact in love with him. So when Beatrice enters from this point onwards, you'll note that Benedict actually starts speaking in iambic pentameter. He actually starts speaking in verse. This line, this line, and then there's this little bit afterwards as well. This shift in the form of Benedict's spoken language probably reflects the shift in his general attitude towards things like love, romance, and marriage. It also reflects an effort on his part to seem more poetic or seem more romantic when speaking to Beatrice. So we have prose, verse, and then verse again down here. It should be noted that only about a quarter of the play consists of verse, so when it's used it's probably important in some way or another. Alright, now let's run through the text closely. Firstly, we have this language of hunting. We have Don Pedro saying, let there be the same net spread for her. Whilst over here, Ursula says, we have caught her. And Hero says, we have laid some traps. Now, this is important because throughout the play, the pursuits of warfare, hunting, and romance are constantly compared to one another and equated. They're all constructed as battles in their own right. Next, we have Don Pedro saying, the sport will be when they hold one an opinion of another's dotage and no such matter. Now this line here, and no such matter, 
is vitally important because it kind of connects to the crux of the entire play. No such matter, right? Falsehoods, gossip, untruths, or nothing. And the fact that nothing, that these lies about their opinions of one another's dotage, actually eventuate into the truths. No such matter actually becomes actual truthful matter. This is reinforced when Don Pedro says, that's the scene that I would see. And then he also describes a dumb show, as in a silent show, a mute show. These are all metatextual elements. These are all meta references to plays within the actual play after Don Pedro just devised another play or just staged another play in order to deceive Benedict. So what we have here are all these references to plays, to falsehoods, to facades, to acting, when the result of all this acting is actually the manifestation of the truth. Perhaps Shakespeare is commenting in some sort of self-congratulatory manner about the power of plays. Anyway, then we have this mention of dinner. So food is a motif, as in a recurring image or idea, that's repeated quite often, especially in relation to Benedict and Beatrice. Benedict and Beatrice used it as a constant. They constantly have these food references where just as food is sustenance for the body, they use it as some sort of sustenance for their banter, for their battle of wits. Keep an eye out for how this motif of food is developed across these passages. Next up, we have the soliloquies. So a soliloquy is a monologue where a character articulates their inner thoughts out loud to the audience when they're alone. Again, when thinking about pairs and comparing and contrasting, look at the two pairs of lovers. We have Benedict and Beatrice versus Hero and Claudio. The latter are far more proper, far more formal than what you'd typically expect in a traditional aristocratic courtship. They barely speak to each other. There's probably a negotiation of dowries, that sort of thing. Benedict and Beatrice, on the other hand, are really similar in their fiery personalities. We have Beatrice referencing her wild heart that needs to be tamed over here. They're also really similar in the way they think, and this is highlighted by their respective soliloquies. They're structured really similarly, and it's no coincidence that these scenes occur directly after one another. It's meant to invite a comparison between the two. They both start by coming forward from their respective hiding spots. Now, you will note down here in this picture of a reconstruction of the Globe Theatre stage that there are these two supporting pillars. Now, these pillars are really useful uh, during the play because you can have Beatrice, for example, hiding over here, whilst here and Ursula and whoever are speaking over here. Afterwards, Beatrice can come out and go into her little soliloquy. Benedict starts by saying, this can be no trick. Well, as Beatrice asks, can this be true? So, Benedict over here is really confident. It's an example of dramatic irony. So, dramatic irony is when the character talks about something that the audience knows, but the character, in fact, does not know. Here, we know that it is, in fact, a trick, and that Benedict is seriously wrong in, in, in his estimation. Just as he's wrong when they say, or when he says that they have the truth of this from Hero, because obviously they don't have it from Hero. But what's important is that although they start with lies, although they start as tricks, it does eventually become true. It does become the truth. Then Benedict changes his tune. After finding out that Beatrice supposedly loves him, he commits to requiting said love. They even use the same word. Beatrice says, love on Benedict, I will requite thee. Again, these two are really similar in their personalities and in the way they think. They can be contrasted against the more traditional, more stuffy relationship that Hero and Claudio have, where Beatrice and Benedict are really well matched, really well aligned. This is reinforced when they both commit to changing the more standoffish, let's say, parts of their personalities, or as Benedict phrases it, their detractions. 
So Benedict recognizes that he bears himself too proudly, that he has too much pride, just as Beatrice recognizes that she, should, she too has too much pride or too much maiden pride, as she puts it, and that she is too contemptuous. Of course, if they fully removed these more abrasive parts of their personalities, then it'd be a little bit disappointing, because these are what make their characters so much fun. So it's good to see that Benedict uh, still takes a jab of sorts at Beatrice when he calls her wise, except for the fact that she's apparently in love in, with him. Of course, this, is, uh, this banter is recontextualized now in the light of their new apparent romance, and he's also being a bit self-deprecating here, which is a bit of a new thing for Benedict. We then have our next food reference, when Benedict says, I have railed so long against marriage, but doth not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Here, food, instead of being talked about in the context of banter and Benedict and Beatrice battle of wits, has now been reappropriated in the context of romance, of marriage, of love. And then Beatrice comes along and Benedict says that he does spy some marks of love in her, as in he can see that she is in fact in love with him. Of course, at this point, Beatrice isn't in love with Benedict. In fact, she's come here against her will. And so we have this notion, we have this irony, that what Benedict spies, or what he sees, isn't based on his vision. He isn't actually informed by what he can see in front of him, he's informed by what he's heard. He's informed by the hearsay, by the gossip that's been intentionally fed to him. So, in this instance, lies are in fact stronger than the truth in their sway over Benedict. We then have our next food reference when Beatrice accuses Benedict of lacking the stomach or lacking the guts to commit to their banter. So, contrasted against Benedict, who has recontextualized the food motif to talk about love, Beatrice is still thinking in terms of their battle of wits. Moving briefly on to Beatrice, when she says what fire is in my ears, there's a couple of different ways of interpreting the word fire here. So obviously she's blushing, so that's why she feels warm in the ears. On the other hand, fire can be interpreted as a spark of sorts, where there's been this piece of gossip, this piece of hearsay that has been dangled in front of her, and she's taken the bait. And now this spark will grow into a fire, it will grow into something stronger than what it began as. And I think the final couplet is a nice place to end on. Beatrice says, For others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it better than reportingly. So what she's saying here is, Because others say that you, as in Benedict, deserve my love, and I believe it not just because they've reported it, not just because they've said so. Well, the irony here is, of course, she does kind of believe it just because that's what she's heard, that's what's been reported to her. But at the same time, just because it's been reported to her, this lie is actually becoming, again, the truth. This report is actually manifesting into something that is actualized, something that is real. And that's the power of lies, that's the power of falsehoods, that's the power of gossip, of acting, of nothing, and much ado about nothing. They can become true.